thank you for um, coming out today um, to this panel, which is technically called Pop Culture from a Multipolar Japan, uh, which I admit is a bit of a mouthful, um, but I'll try to explain it in better terms than that. Um, my name is uh, Roland Nozomu Keltz, and I'm the author of this book. Oh, this is just not, this isn't a book, but um, the author of the book pictured on this placard, which is called uh, Japan America. Uh, and the subtitle is How Japanese Pop Culture Has Invaded the U.S. Um, quickly, I did not come up with that subtitle. Uh, the publisher did, because they wanted a certain generation of readers to think about the British invasion in the 1960s, which was the arrival of the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and various other bands from the UK, and generally has a positive connotation. As some of you may know, in uh, Japan, the word invasion does not have a very positive yeah. connotation. There's a great deal of sensitivity, not only in Japan, but in other parts of Asia, to the term invasion. So when they released the Japanese language edition of the book, I begged my publishers in Japan, Kodansha, to change the subtitle. So the subtitle to the Japanese language edition is Japan's Pop Culture Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I'd give you that note there because um, part of what I'll be talking about today is how not everything translates so easily from culture to culture. Um, when we're celebrating Japanese pop culture here in Baltimore, um, it's a hybrid celebration. It's a combination of two worlds coming together and sort of creating a third world, if you will. Uh, hence the title of the book, Japan America, a uh, sort of hybridized culture. And the image I have up on the screen right now is the central metaphor of the book. You know, when you're um, particularly writing a work of nonfiction, but even writing fiction, it helps to have an image for your reader, something that, that, that can link together all of the ideas or characters or scenes that you're drawing so that it doesn't seem like a bunch of chaos raining down upon you as you try to read. Uh, so this is the image that um, I use in the, in, as the metaphor in the book. Can anybody tell me what this is? Yes. A Mobius strip, yes, or sometimes called Mobius strip. Um, where does it come from? Anyone know? Um, it's a mathematical figure. It's, you know, it's a three-dimensional figure that's one-sided. Yes, a three-dimensional figure that's one-sided. That's a really concise Wikipedia <laughs> definition. I don't mean that pejoratively. It's, it's good. Um, yeah, it's, and it, it's from Germany. I was a German mathematician who came up with the Mobius strip. And you can actually make one very easily, easily by twisting a strip of paper and then um, attaching it. Um, if any of you know the, the, the paintings of um, M.C. Escher, that's right, a lot of his paintings play with that Mobius strip idea, optical illusions, where you think, wait a minute, where are those staircases going? And how could they go that way and this way and so on? And so, can anybody imagine why I chose this? And I, and I have to give credit to a good friend of mine, a guy named Matt Alt, who is a writer, uh, about Japanese popular culture, brilliant guy, um, and a serious uh, mecca otaku in, in the best sense of the word, um, who actually during an interview came up with this uh, image. And when we were talking, and I loved it so much, I said, hey, can I use that in the book? He said, yeah, yeah, right. So that was a freebie. And you know why I used it? Self-perpetual, it keeps turning on itself. Self-perpetual, it keeps turning on itself. What, what does? perpetuates itself and the culture perpetuates itself. Yeah, to some extent, exactly. Except that the two-sidedness is about these two very specific cultures. Japanese culture, of course, but also American culture. As soon as I started conducting research for the book, and I mentioned this yesterday, I had to talk to the people associated with the great father or godfather of anime and manga. Who's that? Osamu Tezuka. Osamu Tezuka, yes, creator of Tetsuan Atom, Astro Boy, and many, many other figures. And um, as soon as I started talking to people who worked with Tezuka, they said, oh my god, he loved 
Walt Disney, and Max Fleischer. Max Fleischer is the American who created Betty Boop, Felix the Cat. If you've seen some of Tezuka's work, you might have noticed the big eyes and the kind of rounded shapes of the characters. It looks very different from, for example, Naruto or Death Note. It's a Tezuka style that he, he created back in the uh, uh, late 1950s. So, right from the beginning, Tezuka is talking about uh, American artists and how much influence they had on him. And that's true of uh, many of the artists of his generation and subsequent generations. There was an overwhelming flood of American culture into Japan right after the war. And as Haruki Murakami told me one time, the novelist, I asked him, um, you know, why did you read so many American novels and listen to jazz and the Beach Boys and, and, and want to eat a hamburger? And uh, he said, uh, you couldn't avoid it. American culture was everywhere after the war. It was the entertainment, with the exception of people like Tezuka who started creating a Japanese form. So right from the beginning, before we get to Baltimore in 2011, it's a hybrid creation. It's a hybrid culture. So um, that raises the question for me as a writer trying to work on this book, what makes it Japanese? Okay, because we know all of us who are here this weekend, we're celebrating a culture that comes from a country, what, 7,000 miles away. <laughs> a small, comparatively small archipelago, slightly smaller than California, actually, um, with a very, very different set of cultural matrices or roots. What are the crucial influences uh, in Japanese culture? What are the crucial sort of cultural bases of Japanese culture? Anybody know? Sorry? Yes, Shinto. What is Shinto? Certainly, a lot of Shinto is about, as you just said, social harmony and group and, and balance and also thinking of other. It's very hard to sort of pin, and it says so many times in Japanese, it's hard to pin an English language word that directly conveys the meaning. So it's sort of tricky to call Shinto a religion in the sense that you can't really convert to Shinto. I'm going to say a few things here today about how different Japan is from the United States. And not to exoticize it, but because I'm half Japanese and have lived there for now as an adult over 10 years, um, I notice the differences even more keenly now than I did when I first moved there. So Shinto is hard to define as a religion because you can't actually convert. You cannot become Shinto. <laughs> you are born into Shinto if you were born Japanese. That's it. It's a given. It's a birthright. So very different from, for example, Christianity, uh, Judaism, where you can actually become those religions. And very similar, in fact, to the country of Japan itself. Because while you can move to this country, as my mother did um, many years ago, and become an American citizen, as she did, you can move to Japan and get permanent residency, but you can't become Japanese. Doesn't matter how well you speak the language, doesn't matter how, how you're married into the, uh, into the uh, uh, citizenry, it doesn't matter how, how well you walk with geita on your feet, or how much you know about the food. You can be beloved in Japan, you can certainly be accepted. I'm not saying that it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, rudely nationalistic nation in that respect, but you don't become Japanese. So there is an exclusionary nature to some of these elements in a Japanese culture. Um, anyone have questions about what I've said thus far, comments? Want to leave it open? Yeah. Would you say that Shintoism is 
say that um, that Shenton is a uh, sort of like the custom, the custom, the tradition of, of the Japanese, of the Japanese people. That's a, that's a great question. And as I just said, it's very, very hard to just sort of nail one word to translate directly what Shinto stands for. I would say almost that it's, it's, it's a way of thinking, going back to what the uh, uh, woman just said, a way of thinking or sensibility. And I think two of the tenets that are important to us here when we're thinking of, of Japanese popular culture are polytheism, right, many gods. Shinto is not about a single figure high in the sky. It's about many, almost, we would go back to, in Western culture, almost to the Greek pagan idea of many gods living amongst us, and they're playful, they're mischievous sometimes, sometimes they're kind of creepy, uh, they play tricks, they trick us, <laughs> they play with our mental selves. So it's a, almost a playful sense of many gods, and uh, they're called uh, kami, Japanese kamisama, and they actually can inhabit inanimate things. So there could be a spirit in this microphone that keeps cutting out whenever it wants to to make a fool of me. I'm not I'm serious. I'm totally serious about that. And if you watch anime and read manga, it makes a lot of sense, right? Um, just something as, as as mainstream, so to speak, as uh, Miyazaki Hayao's uh, Hayao Miyazaki's uh, Spirited Away. Everything seems like it's alive, right? I mean, the grass seems to have a spirit, the, the bouncing heads, I mean, everything is animated. And so you have a polytheistic religion, many gods, many uh, gods in the fields and hills and things, and also a belief in animism, that the world is, anim you know, life is breathed into it, which is what the roots of animation are. Yeah. Great question. Um, I'm, yeah, my mother was born in Japan. I have Japanese uncles and aunts and cousins. Why am I not a citizen? Well, um, currently, if you claim dual citizenship, I don't want to get into a, you know, a huge discussion of passports, but if you claim dual citizenship, you have to, Japan makes you choose one country by the age of 22, I think. I think it's 22. And the government of Japan keeps saying, oh, we're gonna change that, we're gonna have dual citizenship, et cetera, we're gonna let people you know, keep two, citizens, uh, two passports. But officially speaking, you can't, you still can't. So in my case, and I didn't even make the decision, my mother made it for me, but I was a US citizen and that was it. So I cannot retroactively claim Japanese citizenship legally at this point. The government might change that, and I have plenty of friends who um, who have two passports and just hide the other one from the Japanese official. Uh. I'm not going to tell you their names, but they go in and out of the countries and they just hide it. But in my case, I have I have a single passport. So until the government changes that law, um, there's nothing I can do about it. And unfortunately, the Japanese government has so much more to deal with right now. Um, I don't think that's the top of their agenda at the current time. Um, so, but good question. Um, so Shintoism is an element of Japanese culture that really fuels a lot of the ideology and mentality of the Japanese citizen, citizenry, and certainly Japanese artists as well. So there's an element, if you take an artist like Tezuka, or the Yoshida brothers, who created uh, uh, Speed Racer, we know it as Speed Racer, uh, and Battle of the Planets, um, if you take those artists and you look at their influences from America, you have to take into account things like Shinto, because there's something different tweaking these stories. Speed, the main character of Speed Racer, is based on who? Anybody know? Sorry? Who is Speed based on? Oh, someone's on the phone. <laughs> Speed, if you know Speed Racer, the, the cow, the duck, what do they call it? Duck, the tap, cow. Cow. Yeah. He's uh, Elvis Presley from oh. the movie Viva Las Vegas. They love that movie. He's a race car driver and he's got a scarf around his neck. That was styling. So Speed is Elvis Presley. The car in, in 
Mahagogogo. The car, can anybody guess where that car came from? With all the buttons and the jets. Bond movie. Close. Bond movie. James Bond. That's right. In fact, I can't remember the exact film they cited, but it was a James Bond car. So, I think it's Goldfinger. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Um, so the car comes from James Bond, and then uh, they told me that the family, the idea of this kind of family that's kind of eccentric but still hangs together, and everybody knows ultimately, uh, who, you know, who's in charge. Father knows best. The oh. old American, very old American TV show. So you have these elements combined with something like Shinto, on the one hand. One aspect of Japanese culture that fuels and informs what you see and what you read when it comes back to us from across the ocean. It comes back to us in this kind of Mobius strip or Mebius strip form. I'm going to break here and show you a little uh, video clip that kind of encapsulates some of these ideas with some visuals uh, to back them up. A very short clip from a documentary some of you may have seen called Anime, no, what's it called? Anime Drawing a Revolution, or something like that, Drawing the Revolution. Very few documentaries out there about anime. Does anybody know why? I mean, it's, you know, it's popular, look at this convention, thousands of people, why are there so few documentaries about anime? The mainstream media thinks it's too much of a cult audience. Well, it hasn't stopped them before, right? No. I mean, uh, they'll do stuff about uh, speed punk, and you know, they do, they do documentaries. Yeah. With anime and manga, bad connotations. Hmm. Content. That's definitely true, as we all know, I'm sure, there are many misinterpretations about what anime and manga is. But it, that would seem to me an opportunity for a documentary, right? A chance to say, hey, here's what it really is. This is a chance to, to do a documentary. There's actually a kind of more mundane reason why there are no documentaries out there yet. That's definitely true. You're battling that perception in the United States that is decades old, that animation is invariably, invariably for children. So how can you have this you know, psychologically rich, complicated world, uh, sometimes eroticized world, in comic form? So you know, there's, that's definitely true. And these are all, these are all you know, uh, roadblocks in American culture to understanding or appreciating the art. Um, but I'm kind of curious here if anybody has any really more mundane and boring and predictable reason yet. Yeah. Right, the cartoon thing. Okay, no, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you guys are all, you know, these are all prejudices that, that, that Americans have in particular towards, towards comics, but all right, I'm going to have one more person uh, give me an answer and, and see if we can nail this. Yes, Mr. Greenman. Bing bong, as they say. <laughs> the rights. Uh, tomorrow, I'll be doing a panel on Japan's intellectual property problems, which are massive. Mm -hmm. as, and they're, they're more devastating in the digital era than ever before. Mm -hmm. Quick summation, Tezuka sold his anime really cheap to TV studios and networks in Japan in the 1960s. It's called The Curse of Osamu. I'm not making this up. You mentioned The Curse of Osamu to anybody in the industry, they'll go, oh, so, so, so. The, everybody knows. <laughs> he sold his stuff cheap. That relationship was established and really hasn't changed. Networks pay pennies for anime series. They're cheap filler on Japanese TV. The artists make very little, and not only that, but when they sell it to a network, they sign away all subsidiary rights. If any of you are content producers, you know that's where your money is, right? The flat fee doesn't usually cut it. It's the subsidiaries. If a show takes off, if a book takes off, if a CD takes off, that's where you earn your money back. 
So consequently, you make a show, you sell it for a flat fee, and then TV Tokyo uh, and, and Tera, Nippon Tarabi, maybe three other different networks, own the rights. Four or five studios went into creating it. If you watch an animated series of credits at the end, it's just like 40 companies, right? It's never just like Warner Brothers. It's like, I shouldn't say 40, but at least four or five companies whose names are mentioned and then TV networks, etc. They all, all earn, own a little tiny piece of the pie. And so if you go in and try to make a documentary, you have to go to seven or eight different buildings in Tokyo and pray that they'll sign away some part of the rights. But then you gotta go talk to somebody else. And you gotta go talk to somebody else. And maybe after the fourth person said yes, company number five says, ah, we're not selling. Or we're gonna, well, you can do it for this exorbitant fee. And the documentary filmmakers go, ah, forget it. Because how are you gonna do a documentary on anime if you can't show any anime? That's the key reason. And I, and I say that knowing several different companies uh, with big names who've tried, who'd approach me and tried to make a documentary and couldn't get enough rights. Yeah. What time is that panel? I'll pull it up. Yeah, let me just pull it up. <laughs> okay, it's tomorrow from 12.30 to 1.30. So that'll just be focusing on the intellectual property issues. But here's a short uh, clip from a show that actually somehow managed to get some rights. cover subjects that range from action adventure, science fiction and fantasy, to romance, horror, sports, and pornography. Manga is growing in popularity worldwide and represents a market of almost 5 billion US dollars a year. The stories that are successful as manga are often translated into anime. Contemporary manga originates just after the Second World War in a post-apocalyptic Japan. Artists found a new freedom of expression as the country was rebuilt. Western culture in the form of film, art, and literature became more commonplace and influential. One artist emerged to shape the storytelling style of manga. His distinct approach became the inspiration for modern anime. Osamu Tezuka has been referred to as the Disney of Japan, and rightfully so, I would say. Tezuka could do it all. Virtually every genre of Japanese comics could be said to have been invented by him. Tezuko was a very wealthy kid. I mean, he grew up uh, in Osaka, so he had access to these old Disney reels. Tezuka claimed to have seen Bambi 80 times, sitting in the theater in the dark theater with his sketchbook, copying Bambi. But his vision was to take a Japanese aesthetic and combine it with Disney's brilliantly cinematic style of storytelling. Osama Tezuka created a world uniquely his own with a filmic shorthand that exploded the stillness of manga's black and white graphic universe. I love the camera angles and the pacing and, and the way he would tell stories that lasted hundreds of pages. It was like using the panels of the comic, like frames in a film. But he also blended a lot of different influences from, you know, Tex Avery and Looney Tunes and Mickey Mouse. He was just incredibly protean. I mean, he would make manga about Nazi Germany. He would make manga based on Dostoevsky. Uh, and then he would create his own characters such as Astro Boy or Mighty Adam. And then he went out and sold his own books to commuters, uh, people heading back to work in a, in a pretty much decimated Tokyo. 
Tezuka's manga captured the imagination of a shell-shocked audience hungry for meaning in post-apocalyptic Japan. His great influence was the war. Manga was an underground expression of post-World War II Japanese trauma. Tezuka's love of American animation and the popularity of his manga stories inspired his decision to make them move. Astro Boy became the first domestically produced animated series on Japanese television. Tezuka's so anime style, I think, funneled a lot of different styles from America, put them all into a blender, mixed with his own dark, tragic themes and then spit it back out in a way that I think was very accessible to kids, but also spoke to adults. My son. My son. So you've completed it after all. This may mean trouble. I'm taking him with me. I'll bring him up as my son. You can do whatever you like, but you're not taking my son away from me. You really can trace just about everything back to this one guy. Everybody who came after him, all are kind of in the shadow of uh, Tezuka Sensei. Astro Boy's success marks the start of the anime craze in Japan. The rest of the world, including Hollywood, would soon follow. Okay. A couple of, um, to me, key uh, sentiments expressed there about the early years of anime and manga. Can I walk in front of you? Yeah, I'll Okay. Sorry. Um, First of all, um, one of the gentlemen there, all, all of these guys are, are esteemed friends and so on, but uh, mentions that uh, Tezuka is uh, often referred to as the Disney of Japan. Would you agree or disagree with that statement? Yes and no. Mixed. I mean, influenced by Disney, indeed. But disagree. Why would you disagree if you disagree? Why would you say Miyazaki? Everything is cuter, more Disney-like, it's just, it's more Disney. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you would go with, with Miyazaki over Tezuka if you're going to make that comparison to Disney. Good, good point. Yeah. Um, I would also say that Hiro Miyazaki is more of a Walt Disney because he's able to create these wild and amazing worlds that no one's ever seen before, and he does it in a way that both adults and kids can enjoy it. So, plus he's also helping parents and kids uh, more understand his culture and where he comes from. I think that's a compelling argument for Miyazaki being closer to Disney than Tezuka. Let me just say a couple of words here, and then I want to open it up. But um, to me, the comparison of Tezuka to Disney is um, radically off because of the darkness, eroticism, um, psychological trauma that you find coursing through Tezuka's work. Even the somewhat innocent figure of Tetsuwan Atom is constantly doubting who he is, questioning his identity, you know, am I a robot, am I a boy? He's trying to figure out where he is in the world. He's Pinocchio. He's Pinocchio. <laughs> More or less, yes. yes, there's definitely Pinocchio theme in the story. So I think that comparison is a bit far-fetched and, and pushing the envelope to me. What I did like, and one of the comments I do want to highlight though, was the director who points out that Tezuka sort of threw everything in a blender. Hmm. And the reason I like that blender idea is because when we're talking about Japan after the war, uh, sorry, beyond the obvious trauma of having experienced the war, uh, yesterday we talked about the firebombing of 17 major cities and of course the only two atomic bombs to have been dropped in world history thus far. Beyond all that, Japan had its Confucian head or leader locked off. Who was that? The emperor. The emperor, right? The emperor was essentially stripped of his divinity and shown to be a commoner. Just a common guy. The image that always comes to my mind when my mother tells me about hearing his voice on the radio. She said it was stunning because, you know, Japanese of her generation never heard the emperor speak. 
He was a god, right? He was above you. In fact, there are stories of how if the emperor's procession were coming through the streets, commoners were supposed to avert their eyes. Just like you don't look directly at the sun. This is a direct descendant of the sun goddess, Amaterasu. Remember, Japan's origin myth is feminine, comes from a goddess, the goddess Amaterasu. And this is literally a descendant from the sun goddess, so you don't look directly at the emperor. Suddenly, August 15th, 1945, as my mother describes it, this squeaky little voice comes through the radio announcing, we have surrendered, the war is over, we have lost, it's time to rebuild. And it's the emperor. He's on like that transistor radio, or an older radio actually, just for like 1945. My mother remembers that so clearly as being the real shock, because so many Japanese who were not in the military at that time the guys in the military knew that it was over. But many Japanese citizens believed the propaganda, which was dominant propaganda, saying, we will prevail. We will win the war. We are blessed. We are, you know, a, a, a divine nation above all others, and we will win the war. So to hear this emperor reduced to a commoner, it reminds me of that great scene in The Wizard of Oz. Some of you may remember where Toto the dog pulls back the curtain and there's this little guy, balding guy, manipulating levers to be the great wizard of Oz. Well, if you, again, if you're a fan of anime and manga, you know how many stories have that subtext. The great leader is actually kind of pathetic or scrawny or tiny or wizened and old. This notion runs throughout anime and manga. And this brings us to this term, a um, multipolar. And this is why I mentioned that term, blender. The Japan that emerges after the war is effectively leaderless, does not have a father figure. And any of you who studied Confucianism know that one of the key tenets of Confucianism is that, to put it bluntly, father goes best. The father figure is the one who sets the tone and the moral guidelines for the family, the group. In Japan, the shacho, the company boss, is the leader, ultimately. Japan suddenly loses its national leader. And instead, as uh, Professor uh, Norihiro Kato says in his great essay, which I encourage you to read, it's called I uh, think you can find it online. It's called Goodbye Godzilla, Hello Kitty. <laughs> Great title. And what Kato Sensei argues is that what happens in Japan after the war is that instead of a true form of government emerging, instead of a true Japanese national po politics emerging, democracy is imposed upon Japan. Think about those terms, linguistically. Democracy imposed mm -hmm. upon a people. Oxymoronic, right? Yeah. If you ever got that. Democracy is essentially planted upon the Japanese people. It does not grow up organically from the people, you know, by the people, for the people. Not at all. The people don't have anything to say. They have no input whatsoever. The Americans occupy Japan, impose a democratic system, identify a prime minister who, incidentally, one of the most notorious prime ministers is the Class A war criminal, Prime Minister Kishi, who, surprise, signed the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. A Class A war criminal who's not only exonerated during the Tokyo trials, so he escapes punishment, but then he's installed as a prime minister. <laughs> you know, the Japanese people knew this was going on. When you talk to people like Haruki Murakami and people of that generation, they, they knew that this was a fraud, right? This was a joke. And who wrote the Constitution? The Americans. And what did they say? You can't have a military. 
and we will protect you with 50,000 troops who are still there and active as I speak. So you can take a train outside of Tokyo and watch US fighter planes taking off and landing and conducting their drills. Imagine if you could tra take a train outside of Manhattan one hour and see Japanese fighter planes. <laughs> Or Chinese fighter planes? Maybe we'll see that, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so democracy is imposed upon Japan. So what you get is you lose this sense of a kind of binaries of, a, of a, 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 a leader and the people. Instead, you have this kind of blender of a political and national identity. Who are the Japanese? I, you know, I don't know. Who, who are we now? We've got this system called the democracy that somebody lumped on our heads. The emperor, well, they let him stick around as a symbol, but he has no power. He just shows up and waves at the people and says, you know, gambare, be strong. But they, everybody knows he has no power. And then they install this character called the prime minister, one of whom is a war criminal. And the prime minister signed the treaty, working directly with the CIA to make sure that the Japanese people do not protest. And they did protest, by the way. If any of you have read uh, Norwegian Wood, the novel by Haruki Murakami, he describes those student protests in detail. Protesters were beaten down quite violently and suppressed. And then, as Haruki Murakami says, then his, his generation just went to work. Just said, okay, let's go to work. Forget it. You know, give me a suit. Give me a briefcase. Let's build this country. Because you have no other choice, right? You had no say in the politics. Think about this as a, as a statistic, and this is written about a lot. To this day, in 2011, Japan has had five prime ministers in four years. Five prime ministers in four years. And the guy who's there right now, I think he's going to step down next month. So you're going to have six, right? six prime ministers in, what, four or five years. That's astonishing. If you think about just about any other country in the world, and you said they had five or six leaders in four years, you'd have protests, right? You'd expect glass being broken and, you know, people in the square, sorry? Horn of Africa, right? I mean, I don't need to, you know, give you the example, even this country. My gosh, when they were counting chads in Florida, remember the big uh, co controversial election with Bush and Gore? The Supreme Court stepped in and said, that's it. Now it's time to de declare we have a president. And why? Because things are going to get out of control if the U.S. doesn't have a president. <laughs> you know, maybe they get out of control. But I don't want to get too into politics here. But, but uh, my point is, I'm trying to get you to think a little bit about this idea that Japan is a multifarious blender of a culture, a multipolar state, because it lost its binaries. It lost its sense of a leader and the people, its sense of a government from the people, by the people. No, no, no. Everything was imposed upon it. And so when you have these artists like Tezuka and subsequent generations, Otomo, etc., writing about the world they live in. It's much more multipolar in depiction than what you expect, from example, from US popular culture. The superhero stories, the Wonder Woman stories, etc. Instead, you get the girls of Sailor Moon. You get teams, right? Mm -hmm. Groups of people who have to work off each other and figure things out. You don't get the great leader. You get and if you do get the great leader, the great leader is corrupt. A sentai. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, I don't have to keep giving examples of this, but, but this is what I'm talking about when we talk about a multipolar culture coming from Japan. And there are political and historical reasons for that. It's not accidental that you have all these shows. Um, Gachaman, which is called Battle of the Planets, um, has this team of characters who have to solve problems together. And they each have their flaws, they have their. <laughs> One piece here and say, yeah, I mean, we could come up with numerous examples of this very different approach to storytelling, a very different approach to character. Instead of a singular figure or anybody even that you can trust, 
you get you get this <laughs> one of the extraordinarily successful selling points of the Pokemon franchise which is uh, allegedly a 25 billion dollar multimedia industry now it's called the Pokemon Empire <laughs> 68 70 some countries worldwide somebody's gonna know the figure I'm sure but they're over 500 characters now mm -hmm. 600 how many over 600 Pokemon okay so this is a universe that keeps proliferating. It keeps growing. Think of the contrast to, as I mentioned yesterday, Tom and Jerry. Uh -huh. yeah. Every week you get the cat and the mouse. Mm -hmm. Occasionally the dog. Occasionally the dog. Uh, and this is not to slag off Tom and Jerry, it's a very different kind of show. <laughs> but my point being, and, and, and if you know a lot of anime and manga, or you're, you're reading more and more, you'll find that there are characters that keep emerging these series, as you know, tend to go on to 40-some volumes of manga, and new characters are introduced. Characters can die or disappear. Characters can fade away. It's a, as, as, to go back to that comment about Tex Avery, it's a blender of culture. It's a multipolar, you know, multifarious blender of stories, as opposed to what we're accustomed to from Hollywood, for example, the three-act narrative with somebody you can identify with very simply, common denominator character that, oh, everybody can kind of identify with him or her, and a love interest, and a set of narrative cycles that you can easily digest. Japanese stories, and this isn't just post-war, so I want to address that momentarily, but Japanese stories tend to as, as the term in Japan, the never-ending sagas. They go on and on, and they have certain rises and certain falls in narrative structure, but they continue to evolve, and they can add characters and take away characters, and as I said earlier, characters will die, characters will be destroyed. Uh, it's, it's a world that is much more multifarious and decentralized decentralized narrative story. And I think when we talk about the world, this is something I write about in Japan America, the world we live in in the 21st century, after the Cold War, where you had a very clear set of binaries, right? You're, you're the USA or the USSR. You join the side of the USA or you join the side of the USSR, right? I'm not trying to oversimplify. But the Cold War years were very much about binaries. The 21st century, the USSR is a country called Russia, and it's making a lot of money off oil. Uh, the United States is a country that's running out of money, <laughs> as we know, trying to figure out how to pay back its enormous debts. Uh, China has high-speed rail, that uh, although they had a huge accident this past weekend, is a lot faster than any trains in the United States of America right now. Japan is in this, as usual, quasi-gray area, as the Japanese like to say, this, this middle zone where they're stuck on an island out in the Pacific, looking one direction towards the mighty USA, their ally, and the other direction towards arguably a new competitor, China and South Korea. And in this kind of gray zone, they do not create the kinds of stories that we saw during the Cold War. They're creating stories that I believe have a much more direct appeal in a 21st century universe in which there are multiple sources of power and multiple sources of knowledge. Um, again, the perfect metaphor for this is the internet. Um, I believe that manga and anime work very, very well in an internet-ready world where we're constantly ourselves moving from voice to voice, character to character, juxtaposing, jump shots, you know, close-ups, back shots. It feels a lot more like anime and manga than it does like traditional Hollywood movie, movie making or comic storytelling. So let's break for a couple of questions. I'd love to get comments from you on, 
on some of what uh, I've talked about here. Do we, somebody have the mic? I don't know where my right Oh, here she is. Oh yeah, just yeah. People are raising their hands. So. Um, I, um, I, or I guess um, I. Uh, what you said about um, the Japanese having, I guess, usually not having like very binary stories, but having characters like usually a team, or if there's a leader figure, um, they're um, kind of unreliable. Um, that got me thinking. I, um, I actually. Um, look a lot into video games and how video game narratives um, are done. And I've noticed that these days there's a very um, sort of uh, binary look at like Western RPGs and Japanese RPGs. And I know a lot of people complain that Japanese RPGs have, I guess, um, characters who are, you know, whiny or like they're not cool or they go through these moments where they're like, they do something stupid and people don't like that. Whereas a lot of Western RPGs, I mean, this is sort of generalization, sure. have a character who's more sure of themselves. Like um, a character who sort of makes the decisions. And I guess I kind of think of like the Space Marine, but that's very generalized. And so I, I, I guess I was kind of interested in your thoughts on that sort of, um, those, two, those two sort of different worlds. So are you sort of suggesting that the Japanese RPGs are becoming more like Western RPGs? Or, well, no, just um, how that I talk about in the book is this, um, it's these two terms, which are very, very distinctly Japanese terms. Some of you may have heard them, tatamaya. Many of you heard of tatamaya or hone? So tatamaya and hone, can you help us? How would you define them? I'm going to ask the old Takami people. Hello. Um, honne tatamai is referring to the two different sides of Japanese behavior. Honne being your so-called inside behavior, tatamai being what you project to the rest of the world. Yeah, uh, fundamentally. I mean, tatamai, of course, in J Japanese society is very, very important. It's your public face. And you've got to know what to say when you come into the office in the morning. You don't, you know, play around with it. It's not something you improv. <laughs> when you say, oh, hey, I must bow to your boss, you have to bow to a certain degree. Otherwise, you're not being respectful. And you don't just you know, nod your head. You go down at the waist. <laughs> so this isn't wishy-washy stuff, to, to use your term, tatemaya. It's pretty, pretty, pretty damn serious, it, even today. Hone, on the other hand, is really quite rich territory. Because not only is it like what we might say in English, you know, how you really feel, but also there's a deeper definition to hone in Japan, which is how you really feel without having to tell anyone. <laughs> mm -hmm. Get that? Yes. You do not have to say anything, and people should understand how you really feel. Mm -hmm. It's almost a telepathic idea. <laughs> And I'm not exaggerating, hone in Japan is much more than just, oh, what you really think, you know? Because we kind of have that dichotomy in American life, right? We say something, but I don't really like that guy, you know? But it's a much deeper sense of almost mutual understanding, shared understanding. So what this, this split and these two terms, very clear split does in Japanese culture, is it means that when you are outside of your public sphere. You know, if you're, you're Suzuki-san at the office during the day, the 48th floor, uh, trading staff, etc. But once you leave the office and you go and you play uh, a video game in which you're blowing people's heads off, nobody cares because you know the difference between your public behavior and who you are in that sphere and the other world. And the other world affords an enormous amount of freedom. Enormous amount of personal freedom. And I know that sounds strange coming from a country, America, that celebrates personal freedom. But in a way, because the American assumption tends to be, and I say tends, because obviously this is generalization, tends to be, you know, be who you are. Just do it. You know, 
Be who you are. Tell it like it is. So that you're, the assumption is you're always being yourself. Whereas in Japan, because there's this very conscious division between being who you have to be in public and your own time, there's a lot of freedom granted to your own time. And there's also a lot of trust that you understand how to behave. And as long as you are not impinging upon someone else, you have a lot of freedom. I was astonished when I first moved to Japan to see, well, first of all, as you probably know, Japan has the most advanced vending machines in the world <laughs> and has more vending machines per capita than any other country in the world. There is a one vending machine for every 23 people in Japan. And if you visit, you will see them. Yeah. <laughs> now, I was shocked when I first moved to Japan to discover on the corner near my apartment building a vending machine that sold not only beer in several sizes, but fifths of whiskey. <laughs> I'm not making this up. They were on the bottom level, so they had very little space to travel. So they wouldn't break. But fifths of whiskey were being sold out of a vending machine. And the vending machine was obviously running 24-7. And yet, never did I see, during this was in Osaka uh, for a year, never did I once see anybody sitting out on the street corner, you know, slugging a bottle of whiskey and smashing it on the pavement and acting like a drunken maniac. <laughs> never saw that happen. Never once. And, uh, and I did try it. I mean, I'm not, not standing on the corner like a drunken man. <laughs> I sometimes try that, but uh, on my own time. No, um, I did try the machine to see if you could really just any time of day put in uh, a thousand yen and get a, a bottle of whiskey, and you could. It was available. So the assumption was you're not going to exploit that. And if you, if you want to have a bottle of whiskey, you can have it on your own time, as long as you get to the office and behave properly in public life. So I think, just to go back to your question, there's so much sort of freedom that the, even the world of anime and manga can sometimes seem to a, an American pretty wacky, you know, pretty off the wall. Like, why are these characters doing this? But it's partly because, well, we can do whatever we want now because we're not at the office. We're making a manga, we're making an anime. And, and the characters' quirks and eccentricities can be exaggerated in this world. I think that's part of the answer. Yeah, other questions? Sure. This is a big room to run that mic around. Yeah. As far as um, the freedom of that goes, uh, I see in America there's kind of a lot of pressure to express that inner hone and kind of make it join with your outside persona. They talk about a lot of strains on the Japanese because of a lot of social constraints and expectations that kind of perfunctory nature. But it seems like it might be a bit liberating to allow you to fall back on routine and not feel like you have to express that innermost part of yourself. Yeah, that's a great insight. Um, I actually, when I um, talk to Japanese people who have lived in the States, either on a homestay or um, just visited or attending school here, the first question I often ask them is, what was the hardest part about living in America? You know, because it's too easy to say, what did you like about it? You know, it's, oh, well, everybody's nice. You know, it's too easy and everybody could be polite. So I said, what was the hardest part about living in America? And the most common answer I get from students is that there are no uniforms in school. The hardest part. And I say, why, why was that so hard? And I'm sure you can guess the answer. Every day, you have to decide what you're going to wear <laughs> every morning. And there's so much stress. It's exactly what you say. The routine of having a school uniform and knowing everyone's going to be wearing it and you're going to fit right in is such a relief. I came from a private school to a public school and had that happen. You did? Yeah. Yeah. It was a stressor, right? And, and, and that's kind of ironic because, and I even remember as a, as a teenager going over to Japan, and my grandparents lived in Morioko, which is northern Japan, and you know, having an American, or even a half American in town was kind of a big deal. So the local school would often contact my grandparents and say, 
can uh, a couple of students who are learning English come speak to your grandson, just hang out and talk, just so they have the experience of talking with someone, of speaking to a native speaker. So I would be over there in the summer when Japanese students were still going to school. As you know, Japanese students have one month off, right? That's it. And sometimes that's for short. So I would be over there on my summer vacation, all cool in Japan. And these, these, these guys would come over in their starched uniforms. And it was really hot. And they'd be fanning themselves and wiping their brows and, hello, Roland, right? <laughs> and I used to think, oh man, it must be awful having to wear a school uniform. Like, dude, you can't express yourself or be who you are and so on. But those stories gave me a completely different perspective on it. That actually having what is supposed to be that freedom can be utterly exhausting and cause a lot of, of tension. And I think that can be true of American life. I had just quickly another person, a friend of mine, who worked at Condé Nast in New York City, the big magazine publishers. And she's a, long, she's a bilingual Japanese editor and so very accomplished professionally. I said, what was the hardest part? She said, the hardest part was coming into the office in the morning, especially after a weekend. And I said, why? She said, well, first of all, everybody says, what did you do this weekend? <laughs> and she said, I felt so much pressure to come up with something, like, I don't know, I went to the beach, or, you know, I went to a movie. And she said, and sometimes on the weekends, I just sat around, <laughs> you know? And I didn't know what to say. And that sounded so boring. And then she said, the other thing was exhausting was, was having to smile at everybody in the office. You know, when you, when you go to an office in Japan, when you work in a Japanese office, you, you basically just say, oh, I was almost, I was almost, you just say good morning. And nobody really looks at you twice and you go straight to your desk and you get to work. It, there's not a lot of fuss, usually. But she said in the States, like she said, if, if I was just tired and I didn't smile that much, somebody would come down to my cubicle and say, hey, uh, you know, Mariko, you okay? <laughs> you wanna talk? <laughs> How you doing? And she'd be like, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> and she said, because she didn't smile enough, you know? So it's a kind of paradox. This, this utter freedom can also be really constraining and, and as you said, stressful, exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. One of the common threads that I heard between yesterday and today is a lot of attention from American, almost imposed cultures and ideals, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that and how it might um, come through and is manifested in the manga and anime. Yeah, if, um, if I'm able to show you a clip, you think that'll work? Just a moment. Okay, just a moment, sure. Um, this, uh, the pressures mean of the sort of American occupation and imposed, we well, have to look, I mean, this is a very interesting aspect of American history, and if I get a chance, I'll show you a very, funny clip from a series called Samurai Champloo. Samurai. <laughs> An occasionally brilliant series, I have to say. Somebody may agree. Um, but um, I had pointed this out yesterday. Whenever, you know, Japanese anime and manga is, is really quite historical. Sometimes perversely historical. Like just mixing and matching bits of history <laughs> and playing with it. Yeah. But there's a, lot, there's a lot of sort of mixed nostalgia in the art form. It's really strange because on the one hand it sometimes feels cutting edge, and on the other hand sometimes it feels like it's always looking back and trying to figure things out. I'm gonna quote, uh, or not quote, but cite a book by a, a, a Japanese theorist named Hiroki Azuma. Some of you may have heard of this book, Otaku Database Animals, or Database Animals, I guess. Um, really highly recommend it. It was published uh, originally in 2001 and then the English edition came out quite recently and he, he uh, reconfigured it. Oh yeah, I wanted to have the guys from uh, Gachamanga, Battle of the Planets up there to give you this team identity, that notion, because this was very influential on um, the American director George Lucas when he created Star Wars. Uh, you know, in Star Wars, one of the sort of groundbreaking aspects of that original film was this cockpit full of eccentrics who have to kind of get the job done, right? And they have differing personality. I mean, one of them is, uh, you know, Chewbacca. The, what is he? Wookie. 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 Sorry. And one of them is Chewbacca. So I mean, there are all these different characters that have to kind of get along and get the spaceship where it's going. And it's very much a part of a lot of Japanese anime uh, stories. 
So go back to this question. You know, even, um, I should say even, but uh, if you look at Miyazaki, Miyazaki's films from top to bottom, they are extremely nostalgic. And they're always depicting a post-war Japan. It may not say that straight away, and the technologies may be from, uh, sorry, they're always, I made a mistake, they're always depicting a pre-war Japan. Those landscapes that Miyazaki lovingly portrays and those villages and those back roads and those, they do not exist in Japan today. Japan has been, Japan, there's more concrete per square kilometer in Japan than the entire United States. It's, a, it's heavily developed. Uh, and a lot of the rivers have been uh, concreted over or destroyed. A lot of the landscape has been destroyed. Uh, Miyazaki said to me uh, during an interview in uh, California a few years ago that he sometimes wishes a great wave would just sweep over Tokyo and destroy all these buildings because they're appalling to him. So a lot of the artists are looking back. And part of what they're doing, and I mentioned Azuma because he writes about this very eloquently, is trying to find a Japanese identity that isn't yet informed, or if you will, if you want to be pejorative, contaminated by American influence, and particularly Western influence. Now, this does not mean that they reject the American influence. I mean, any Japanese person today, whether a mangaka or anime director or whatever, you know, they pop into Starbucks, and they don't think twice about it. It's not that they're actively rejecting the presence of Americanisms or American culture, but there is an, something of an identity crisis going on in which so many of the artists are trying to find what's Japanese about their world and their lives. The obsession with samurai, with ninja, with, with martial arts, something that's Japanese, right? <laughs> And you've got to be eating ramen, and you've got to have an onigiri, you know. You've got to be doing these things, because there must be something that's Japanese. And one of the perversions that I mentioned earlier is that almost always when a traditional Japan is pictured in anime or manga, it's Edo era Japan, 16th and 17th centuries, right? Because what happens in the 19th century? Commodore Perry <laughs> and his black ships arrive at uh, the port, Izu Peninsula, yeah. the port of Shimoda, and by 1854 they successfully convinced the, the uh, Tokugawa regime that it's time to open up Japan. So in a way, as my friend Matt all points out, Japan was invaded, if you will, or at least occupied by Americanisms twice. When Perry arrived, and then MacArthur arrived. And both times it was the United States with superior technology opening the door to Japan, entering Japan. And, and both times Japan's response was, we gotta catch up. <laughs> we gotta start developing things. <clears throat> in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, Japan did developed a very uh, a powerful infrastructure. The Zaibatsu corporations started to rise, and then Japan became obsessed with going to war and conquering Asia. And we all know how that ended. Um, after World War II, Japan becomes once again obsessed with developing, but it can't have a military. So, you know, the whole Mecca story is partly about all these brilliant engineers who instead of being hired and paid to create actual warships, were creating spaceships out of their imagination. One of the reasons those mecha designs are so brilliant and detailed and actually realistic is that these guys were engineers. These guys who were making stuff, you know, Shinji Aomaki is an engineer. He, he knows how to create, you know, an actual ship. But instead of doing so in a country where you can't make, you're not supposed to make military devices and property, it goes into the imagination and emerges as a dream world or fantasy world of technological prowess. So I would say to a great extent, the Americanism, the American blanket over Japan remains a big hang up. And it's bound to be so because 
um, and no one really can see a solution to the occupation, 50,000 troops. I mean, nobody, they don't call it an occupation, but what is it, right? Uh, it's a very complicated situation. Yeah. Uh, one thing that always, I, I couldn't really understand is uh, Japan, in some of their anime, they have characters like Goku and, and Naruto and, and uh, Luffy from One Piece, where they're very individual, they're very self-powered, yeah. and it's always, like, they're in group dynamics, but it always comes down to they need to save everyone. And that seems like a very individual type of uh, uh, characteristic that, it, I mean, you can see the wishy-washiness in a lot of other things, but then there are also these self-important, very self-confident characters that are very individual. So what led to that? That's a good point. I think, I mean, I, mean, I can't deconstruct every, uh, every scenario that you're speaking to, but I think one thing you have to keep in mind that when you're talking about um, anime and manga, you're still talking about pop culture. So there's still the yearning, I mean, it depends on who the artist is and in what context, but to entertain, right? Especially with a series like that. So you're playing with archetypes, and if you have a culture in which group harmony and stability and social stability are deeply prized, then a character who's a bit of a wise-ass is a lot of fun in that mix, right? Creates a lot of, of tensions that are quite appealing. Tensions that might be quite subtle, in a way, because of the sensitivity to group dynamics. So I think that may be a part, part of the answer to your question. Another answer that is very obvious, I suppose, is that artists from the 1980s onward, especially if they lived in the Tokyo area, were starting to actually encounter more Westerners. You know, prior to, you know, in Tezuka's years, he, didn't he, you know, he met Fred Schott and was sort of surprised that this white guy wanted to work with him. Uh, Fred Schott is the writer of Manga Manga and many other wonderful books and was also Tezuka's interpreter and translator um, back in the 70s. So it was kind of a shock, like, whoa, what is this guy doing here? But by the 80s and into the 90s, artists would see, you know, Western behavior. And so a lot of that hybridity, like I said, with the, the Mobius strip, it keeps happening, and it has, starts happening faster and faster with contemporary technology. You could be sitting in, in uh, Fukuoka, Japan, and uh, click online and see an American movie in a few seconds, right? <laughs> and so you can be influenced, if you will, just, just in, in your home in Fukuoka. So it's much easier, just like a, uh, a, yeah, an American in Nebraska can, can watch an anime series from top to bottom. These days, almost the day it's released in Japan, or hours after. <laughs> so the speed of interchange is, is quite astonishing right now. I take one more question and I just want to show a clip. I don't know anybody. <laughs> Sorry to put the onus of that on you. <laughs> um, I've noticed in like a lot of Japanese dramas and manga and anime that like the hero is usually dressed in black and the villains are always like bleach blonde hair, head to toe, white suits. And even in Korea, um, the hero is known as a black knight, or as we usually know him as white knights. Mm -hmm. Is there like, considering that like, just the head to toe white is so far from the status quo in Japan, is that maybe? That's an excellent question. I would have, I mean, maybe someone else in the room has a better answer to that. I would just, just theorize that um, on the one hand, you know, black in, in Japan, I mean, the ninja character, who, by the way, is a mythic character. There were ninjas who were spies, who were trained as spies, but they didn't wear all black. And Just like no spy worth his salt would, would get anywhere if he dressed in black, right? <laughs> You'd say, I'm a spy. It's the last thing a spy wants to do. So there were ninja characters actually existed in Japanese history, but just like any spy, they tried to dress like the local people and fit in. They might have had skills, but if you were in a farming village, you dressed like a farmer. So the black thing is very much a kind of mythic idea, black, stealthy, you can get around at night, and so on. Um, but a lot of manga and anime, remember, plays with Western conventions and stereotypes. I know a lot of you have, have, some of you have seen Evangelion, of course, the, the <laughs> epic series, but even a lot of, of, of uh, 
less sort of epic series, you'll see a cross or a nun, mm -hmm. you know, or a reference to Christ, Cristo. And you, if you try to figure it out, lots of times it's just playing around. It's just playing with imagery. Because the artists realize that these images have a great deal of power somewhere else, but in Japan, they're just kind of like, Ooh. you can, you can, Sure. Sure, and why not, why not play with that stereotype that you see in the West, right? Because you, you don't have to adhere to it. And also, I think a lot of the white evil, white, uh, sorry, white uh, gown wearing or dressed evil characters in anime and manga, a lot of them are really devious, right? Mm -hmm. Really tricky. It's that kind of evil. So that's fun to play with, right? It's like a decoy. Oh, a character all dressed in white with blonde hair is actually really, you know, venal. <laughs> trying to trick you. I mean, some of this is play. It's important to remember that, you know, as that old saying goes, art is serious play. And some of that is, is what's going on here, too. Um, this is going to be tricky. I'm going to, I just want to show you this clip first because I brought it. And these guys were kind enough to set up the... This is a, a just short, I'm going to skip around a little bit, but this is a Samurai Champloo episode. Woo! Some of you may know it. Baseball. Episode 23. <laughs> I think some people hate this episode, but... I love that. It's hilarious. Yeah, it's, it's the, it's a total Ninja baseball. Ninja baseball. Of history, sports history. <laughs> and rap music. Now these are, this is from a rip, so they're, they're introducing the characters here. But they basically reinvent the Perry story. Uh, the arrival of American Commodore Perry. They reinvent it with a couple of characters who had nothing to do with Perry. Down on the right. Down on the right. Oh, well, alt right enter. Here? Yeah. Sorry, thanks. So um, they completely retell the Perry story using. Um, a oh, different set of characters. Oh, he's going to leave it open. Good job. And, uh, let me move ahead here, so. Looks what happened in the side of this. What is that? Oh, 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 oh,
みっちり働いて返すかちょっとあんた責任取りなさいよおめえらもさっさと逃げりゃよかったんだよ何言ってんのよ一ヶ月は禁止出るしかないだろう大体うん、野球ってのは何だろうベースボール何の向こうのスポーツよ、まあ、この球を投げてでバットつぼけるパタキゃいいんだよなんだよ冒険遊びだよ遊びじゃねえんだよこいつはこの国の運命のかかった勝負なのさ何だよまあ話は1週間前に遡るんだけどさ Here comes history anime style <笑> <laughs> Who's in charge here? Hey, Kokono Sekiri Shawa, Dokuni Maska. Was that Kokono Maji to see who is Yaga? Kono Katawa, they go to Higashi in the Kanta Shire Chokan, Joy Cartwright Taitoku, but as you are, Suyaku no Double D. This, whatever they go to, Kono Kuritono, Su Show, Motomete Yate Kimasta. そんな大変なこと言われてもそれに異国の船は即刻打ち払いというお触れが出てきますよね Fuck them! <笑>間違えちゃいけない我々は俺がいに来てるのではないこれは命令なのですよそれとも我らの戦争でもしたいですか Whoa! Baseball? Son of a gun. Baseball on a little island in the Far East? Incredible. The sport of gentlemen comes to the country of savages. What? <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. All right. That's uh, obviously a uh, a brilliant or bizarre mashup of history, uh, Edo era history, of course, 16th, 17th centuries. The Americans, actually, America was not even really a country yet. Yeah. It certainly didn't have any trading going on in. There was nothing called the American East India Trading <laughs> Company. The British had an East India Trading Company, of course. Cartwright never went overseas.、Um, and he was apparently, somebody says, they, they, somebody aside, he's in the Cooperstown Baseball Hall of Fame, but he never really did anything. Anyway, the absurdity runs on and on. But, it's, but in, in, again, as I'm sort of talking about、uh, throughout this session, this blender of culture, this blender of sensibilities, this mashup culture. Feels very 21st century, I think,、um, for those of us who appreciate it、uh, today. A multipolar、um, sensibility. I'm running out of time, and I just want to mention、um, the very fine folks downstairs at the dealer's room、uh, for Conlon Press,、uh, Peter S. Beagle's publisher, Peter's down there as well,、um, are, are、um, selling this book、uh, downstairs.、Um, I'm going to pop down there after this for a few minutes.、Um, I'd be happy to sign a book for you down there if you're interested in, in having that done.、Um, I'm having an autograph session, I guess, today at 2 30, I think. So、um, I would love to talk more with you about some of these things. And I know a lot of you had your hands raised. And,、um, it's just difficult to、uh, get it all into the time period. It's at 2 30.、Um, but at 2 30, yeah, I'll have that session. So please come by and say hello and introduce yourself. And if you have questions about, or comments about some of this, I'd love to hear from you. And,、uh, and talk with you.、Uh, that's why I'm here anyway. Thank you so much for listening and, and paying attention. Thank you. And great questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.